everyone I'm really happy to see you in this lecture I usually start when I introduce our speakers with the words that we have a guest here but I'm not sure how I should be introducing Ashley on the one hand she is a guest speaker on the other hand she has spent almost 10 months with us which means she's part of our team already we are about to start shedding our tears because she's going to leave soon. Ashley came to work here with the help of the Fulbright program. I'm sure all of you know this US-based program that allows US researchers do their research the same as Ukrainian researchers and scholars could go abroad to other countries to do their study. Ashley was affiliated to our institute 10 months ago. Since that time, she has worked here. She has conducted her own research. She is proactive to participate in our projects as well. And I hope she's having fun. Ashley is an architect by her background. She has the master's degree in architecture, graduating from the Yale University. And she has experience teaching at the Tennessee University. She also has the practical work experience as an architect in architectural bureaus in the USA. She came to Ukraine with her own research and she studies the historical fortresses of Ukraine and their modern adaptation. During this year, she stayed here. She was lecturing on the special course for the students of Lviv University on memorial architecture and its modern adaptation. The course was very successful. We even had to get two groups of students because there were so many of them willing to join the lectures, combining the students from several universities in Lviv. It was another brilliant experience both for the students to have a chance to communicate with a lecturer from abroad from another country and also get to know new formats of work and I hope Ashley also found it this a very useful experience to work with our students. This lecture is most probably based on the research she is doing in Ukraine but it is also of a broader nature because we are going to talk about the defense structures, about their development and the way they adapt to every age and also to the modern day age. She's going to talk about the challenges for architects, both for the researchers and the practitioners. She's going to provide the practical examples from Ukraine on the basis of her study. I think it's too early to thank her for staying with us. But anyway, for us as the center, there was the first experience to have a guest speaker. And the experience was really successful. And we are really happy uh, to have her with us. Now I will pass the microphone on to Ashley. After the lecture, you will have a chance to ask your questions or probably to discuss things that will be interesting for you. You're welcome, Ashley. Thank you very much, Irena. To start with, I would like to express my gratitude to the Center of Urban History and to my colleagues, and especially to Sofia Dejak and Irena Matsevko for their support. Also, I would like to thank to all of my friends for the great time I had in Lviv. Now, if you don't mind, I will switch to English and also try to speak uh, very slowly so that everyone who is listening with the translator can keep up. So, um, as it was mentioned, I am now uh, ending my Fulbright study in Lviv. And today, what I will present is a really sort of brief summary of my research here. Um, this research began as an investigation of Ukrainian castles. Uh, I wanted to find how Ukrainian castles were different 
and how the specific influences of Ukrainian vernacular architectural traditions shaped castles in Ukraine. Instead, I found the exact opposite. In the beginning, I was somewhat disappointed that I had not been able to pinpoint uh, the unique architectural forms. But I soon realized that more important than the difference was the generic. With the discovery of a sort of sameness came a revelation that even castles are not immune to the forces of globalization and that the typology of castles can be viewed as a script or system for creating architecture. I found that more powerful than the vernacular was the global, even if that's the global of the Middle Ages. Today I will tell you two stories. The first is the story of globalization and how it manifested itself during the Middle Ages and how it influences arch architecture today. The second is a more local story of Ukrainian castles and the future of these structures. These two stories are woven together, and although they are seemingly disparate, they cannot be separated. It's also, also worth noting that I began this research in January of this year. The timing of such events was unpredictable, yet enlightening for me. While studying historic defense building techniques, modern day barricades were being built on Maidan. The parallels were apparent, yet distinct. I think that these events made me more aware of the political and socio uh, societal implications of public spaces and the importance of these spaces in Ukraine. It was always a goal of this project to connect Ukrainians to their past through an architectural future. And Maidan events made this connection even more important. Architecture has always been political. Intentionally or unconsciously, architecture engages politics to create organizing principles, forms, and aesthetics. Architects often note the influence of art and technology on the physical development of architecture, but it's equally important to examine the political mechanisms that often lie just below the surface. As theorist and architect working today, Keller Eastling has stated, more than any other profession I can think of, the work of architecture engages multiple realms from finance to logistics to the heights and depths and friv of frivolity and fiction that ultimately rule the world. There's a long history of architects drawing inspiration from military architecture and repurposing these traditions. In 1860, the well-known architect Villers Ledoux published a book entitled Military Architecture which included over 150 illustrations documenting all types of changes in military architecture from the Middle Ages. Even earlier, in 1570, Andrea Palladio was interested in military aesthetics and drew military formations that later resembled colonnades in his buildings that were published in his um, very famous treatise, entitled Four Books of Architecture. Much more recently, in the 1990s, architect Paul Virilio published several important texts concerning power, war, and architecture. His most famous book, Bunker Archaeology, was an exploration of World War II bunkers on the French coast. Architects are uniquely qualified to understand both the history and the future of defense aesthetics. However, today it is typically anthropologists, sociologists, or historians who are concerned with how militarization affects the built environment. Today I will focus on three main questions. How is architecture responding to the current socio-political shift towards the organizational structures of the Middle Ages? What can we learn from medieval history that will help us face today's defense crises? And how can Ukraine interpret and inhabit the remains of its own defense architecture? There were three main forms of societal organization during the Middle Ages, feudalism, church, and empire. 
These three th systems thrived on their lack of territorial control and their ability to encompass one another or coexist simultaneously. The Middle Ages was a period of complex interactions between different forms of territorial structures, a world of overlapping jurisdictions. As the historian Joseph Strayer explained, quote, the, basics, the basic characteristics of feudalism in Western Europe are fragmentation of political authority, public power in private hands, and a military system in which an essential part of the armed forces is secured through private contracts. In 1977, the anthropologist uh, Hedley Bull first used the phrase new medievalism to describe the current global world where political authority is shifted away from sovereign states and into an international system that resembles the medieval system. Like the Middle Ages, new medievalism is characterized by political authority that is exercised by a range of overlapping organizations, including religious, organizations, principalities, city-states, or empires. Other scholars, notably Saskia Sassen from Columbia University, has also noted these links between the structures of the Middle Ages and today. In 2006, um, political scientist John Rapley wrote that, quote, the coexistence of local and transnational identities that typified the European Middle Ages has reappeared. Today, those identities might include capitalism and groups such as multinational corporations, trade unions, political alliances, and religious groups. In today's form of globalization, these global institutions can overcome borders and governments. All over the world, we see conflicts brought on by shifting allegiances between nationalities, ethnicities, and religions that are eroding the modern concept of a nation state. The most recent period of globalization did not create a homogeneous world. Instead, globalization creates worlds within worlds and overlapping territorial spheres. Using this knowledge as a background, the focus of this research is on these influences as formalized through the physical environment, namely in the architecture of castles, fortresses, and fortified cities. Long before capitalism and modern technological advances, the basic ideas of globalization were influencing territory and architecture. Globalism was even a part of the ancient Greek and Roman empires going back to the 5th century BC. For example, the method of Roman town planning in every corner of the Roman Empire was the same. When Romans conquered existing settlements, they quickly imposed their own town planning over the existing urban fabric. During the Middle Ages and into the Renaissance, military architecture evolved dramatically. New architectural strategies spread across nations, and architectural developments from France and Italy were soon appearing as far east as present-day Ukraine, Poland, and Russia, places which had independently developed a very distinct style of wooden vernacular architecture. Throughout these historical periods, one constant remained, the need for defense architecture that protected against weapons of the age. Defense architecture did not develop independently, Rather, advances in infrastructure countered advances in weapon technology. Architecture developed quickly alongside weaponry, siege tactics, and changes in warfare. When new defense forms were introduced, such as bastions, ravelins, and moats, they were copied, manipulated, and reproduced. Because weapons and tactics were exchanging between different civilizations during military conflicts, defense architecture began to conform across various lands and civilizations. Methods proven to work against new weapons dominated. Successful forms were contagious. Medieval castle typology radically changed in the 16th century with the technological improvements of the cannonball and then again with the invention of the firearm. Most notable were changes from stonewall construction to burned bastions backfilled with earth, 
changes in the formal relationship between towers and walls to allow better shooting angles, and the addition of wooden ramparts and earthen works outside the stone walls. These formal changes, all brought about by the demand in warfare technologies, created entirely new typologies of castles and fortresses towards the end of the Middle Ages. By the start of the Renaissance, fortresses and specifically towers were shorter, wider, and more geometric in their planning than their earthen defenses. They also kept a greater distance between the attackers and the defenders. Older fortresses were adapted and changed as quickly as possible. Not to do so would endanger the lives of the inhabitants. Fortresses began to resemble one another in their underlying geometric principles. Their organization was based on a series of relationships that could be deployed at any location and be adapted to different typo typologies. The fortress typology as a generic system gave preference to technology and self-preservation above all. In this way, the globalization of warfare left a distinct mark on architecture. Feudal geography manifested itself through st strategic outposts and strongholds associated with allegiances to nobles and control over people rather than territory. This distinguished the medieval style of authority from the modern nation state, where territorial borders are vast and all important. The Middle Ages saw the rise of strong city-states that were centers for local economies and nodes along trade routes for a multicultural world, as examples here in Kamenets Podilsky, a, a city in Ukraine. The focus on fortifying small territories, such as cities, trade centers, and customs crossings, created a landscape dotted with fortresses and castles that often surrendered control to invading groups rather than see their st structures destroyed. It was typical for control of such fortresses to go back and forth between different authorities, especially in Eastern Europe and the regions of present-day Ukraine, which was seen as the borderland between Europe and Asia. As a result, Western Ukraine is left with the remnants of territorial authority in the form of castles and fortresses. This region of present-day Ukraine was frequently the site of interactions between Polish, Austrian-Hungarian, Cossack, and Turkish forces. All of these groups contributed to the layered history of these structures. Within this small region of Western Ukraine, you can see a range of styles and forms. While each of these castles is unique and diverse, their origins are global ar 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 architectural typologies. How can we compare a group of castles that are so diverse? From the smallest of these, Olesko, to the largest, Kotin, many different forces influence the size, des design, and landscape of the fortresses. To understand the different fortresses that were creating the forms, I created several drawings to understand the origins of the designs. On one hand, they reflect some of the most primitive forms, geometries and architectural traditions. On the other hand, each is a nuanced mix of various forces. From the beginning typology, defense architecture is easily transformed by influences of geometry, landscape, and program. The original typologies themselves are shaped by a, by a variety of characteristics. Courtyard and concentric plans allowed for a central space that was highly protected and could be used for gathering. Radio plans were developed to defend against advanced weaponry. The topographic object capitalized on existing extreme landscapes. And the thickened wall enclosure could house large armies with a minimal footprint. As each fortress was adapted to its particular site and time, unique designs developed. The diagram on the right explores defining characteristics that dictate fortress design, architectural and urban typologies, the natural and artificial landscapes. 
The diagram illustrates the complex relationship and overlap of these forces. Fortresses do not draw from one typology alone. Instead, they are frequently a complex combination of various forces. This ma matrix gives a clearer picture to the slight variations in the different designs. As much as the image on the left provides a clear history of transformations, the layered creation of fortresses is much better represented by the diagram on the right. If we take a closer look at one example, Komenes Podilski Castle, we can track its architectural transformation over time. As the timeline diagram shows, the city fortress fell under the rule of several different authorities during the height of its use. With each transfer of power, the castle was rebuilt and adapted to new inhabitants, which you can see on this lower timeline. I want to pinpoint uh, here that the architectural transformations did not end uh, at the start of the 19th century. Even after the castle was not used for battle, it was used as a prison, a common reuse of castles during the 1800s, and more recently is home to a museum and the site of several annual festivals. During all the transformations and transitions of authority, the architecture has continued to change. In fact, the common feature between all the castles in this region is their evolution and adaptation over time. I believe that it's more important that their final form is the rich tradition of change and adaptation. And I hope that all of these castles can find a new life that is as culturally relevant as their past life. And now I want to zoom out again to the global scale. Keeping in mind the history of medieval political systems, I want to examine how defense architecture, a, a discipline rooted in ancient, physical, and fundamental architectural techniques, has adapted to the more slippery world of today's international global systems. How did we get from the local to the global? It's first a question of scale. How do we get from the scale of a city fortress to the global scale of territorial walls? The first step away from the traditional castle architecture was the aesthetic shift of the 17th and early 18th century, which took defensive forms and used them as ornament or otherwise manipulated their original purpose. After the immediate threat of invasion had somewhat subsided, wealthy landowners in England began quoting historic defensive architecture in their designs for estates, gardens, and houses. Many of these English landowners themselves had been involved in various military campaigns and included that imagery in their architecture. With an almost nostalgic overtone, architects of the time were able to draw from Europe's military history to give their patrons a sense of expansive possession, pride, and victory, even if they had only managed to conquer the natural landscape. Architects such as Capability Brown and John Van Brill attacked their sites as if they were at war, destroying, sculpting, and reclaiming the English landscape for themselves. These elements were deployed with little concern for their original use, and copies of copies even lessened their original function. Animals were kept out of English gardens by use of a ha, -ha or a military-style ditch. Crenellated walls can be seen at Castle Howard and Blenheim Palace estates designed by Sir John Van Brill. Here. The purpose of these military aesthetics was to symbolize power over territory rather than physically defend that territory through military force. The second aesthetic shift in defense architecture was the opposite of this first shift. It resulted in the complete avoidance of any elements that had appeared to be defensive. Modernism prized transparency and openness above all, as seen in the famous Philip Johnson's Glass House from 1949. Contemporary architecture, therefore, hides defensive mechanisms behind glass walls, mirrored reflections, underground bunkers, 
and garden landscapes. In this project by Morphosis in Los Angeles, bollards to prevent vehicles from entering the plaza become sculptures. In other projects, moats masquerade as rainwater retention ponds. It's in the nature of modern architecture to fight against this defensive narrative. We do not like to see such a visible representation of our own fears. So modernism overcompensates with more glass and reflective surfaces. As with so much of our lives, for Americans, architecture lives in the shadow of September 11, 2001. Following the terrorist attacks, Defense became a critical consideration for all public building designs, not only for buildings with specific military programs. Buildings like the Freedom Tower, that sits on the former site of the World Trade Center Twin Towers, shows this conflict. The tower's facade is glass and highly reflective, but the first 20 floors of the building have no windows at all. Architects work, working on public projects are faced with the challenge of how to protect the defense aspects of their, how to project the defense aspects of their designs. We can celebrate or hide these defensive aesthetics that must be incorporated into public architecture. Should they embrace the heavy, solid base or should they do as the Freedom Tower does and mask it? Just as the cannonball and the firearm revolutionized warfare for previous generations, modern technology developed in the 20th century has transformed our current system of defense. We are currently in a moment of shifting global and political authorities. Intelligence agencies are dealing with an information overload. The current military revolution is in part an information revolution. The challenges of amassing and synthesizing large amounts of data gained through an overlapping network of satellites, networks, systems, and radars are immense. Architecture is a system that is the result of a larger culture. As Christopher Alexander stated, the system's point of view is not neutral. It will change your view of the world it will lead you to realize that the most important characteristics of human individuals are products of their interactions with other people. It will lead you to realize that the life of nations, though these nations may seem self-sufficient, is produced by interactions in the whole world and that they only get their strength from their, this position in a larger world. Just like during the Middle Ages, it is our interactions with other nations that produces a large part of our built environment. The threat of terrorism is unique in its reliance on public opinion and media campaigns to recruit new followers. This information war can be swayed heavily by public opinion. From the Middle East to the current crisis at the Ukrainian-Russian border, Information wars are fought alongside physical conflicts. Architecture has always responded to weapons, but how should architecture combat something as fluid as information? To start, we should realize that architecture is one of the most visible physical artifacts a culture can produce, and buildings are an opportunity to project and express cultural ideas. Embassy buildings are often on the front lines of the information and perception war. Architecture is being used as a soft power, and architects should understand this opportunity. Rather than design a generic embassy and enclose it with a daunting wall, the US Design Excellence Program employs architects to develop more creative solutions to the issues of security and image. Established in 1994, the program has encouraged the use of architects that design culturally responsive buildings that fit into the context and show the unique features of American culture while protecting the people who work there, which is always the first concern. Even with the sophisticated technology of today, 
Defense architecture projects are returning to the tried and true methods of landscape fortification that worked so well for early castles. Historically, the key to defense architecture has always been the landscape, and recent projects show a welcome return to a landscape approach to defense. One of the best examples of this is the design for the new embassy in London by Kieran Timberlake, the, U the new American embassy in London. This design uses a sloped garden to separate the cube building from the surrounding context and to restrict circulation to the site. The overwhelming glass facade attempts to draw attention away from what looks like a more typical fortified base. As described on the architect's website, quote, in contrast to high perimeter walls and fences, security requirements are achieved through landscape design, such as a large pond, low walls with, be with bench seating, and differences in elevation that create natural, unobtrusive barriers. Just like during the Middle Ages, the first concern for embassy designs should be safety. But the aesthetic shift from stone fortresses to glass towers reflects an evolution in symbolism. The first attempts to instill reverence in the viewer, and the second extends an invitation for entry. In the case of the Netherlands Embassy in Berlin, designed by OMA architects, the plan cuts through the site with two distinctive forms a cube containing offices, and a wall providing embassy residences. The separation from the wall to the cube creates bridges that use the same type of separation as many medieval city fortress plans. Although the outward expression of the design is very modern, the planning is quite medieval. The separation allows an extra layer of security between the public zone of the embassy and the private zone of the residences. The elevated entry to and from the private residences allows a quick and discreet circulation zone for everyday users of the building. The relationship between architecture and territory often manifests itself in seemingly mundane structures. For example, we can examine the seemingly simple element of the wall. The wall may be the most overlooked architectural device in its sheer possibility for invention, reinterpretation, and adaptation. From formal analysis to construction studies, the wall as an element has been thoroughly documented. However, when used beyond the purely architectural realm as a political device, the wall can exhibit hyperstate extremes. From the 9th to the 16th century, fortified walls across Europe went through a series of developments in construction methods and form to strengthen it against changing warfare. Similarly, the fortified wall of today takes many shapes and is symbolic as much as it is functional. Global walls are not new but they are becoming more popular as a way to deal with political conflicts. With the decline of the nation state, the perceived need for global walls has increased in recent decades. The modern global wall is rich in its ingenuity, adaptability, and ability to go largely unnoticed as a piece of architecture. In the centuries since the first global walls, surprisingly little has changed in the motivations for these structures. Although they are no longer adorned with crenellations at the top, modern global walls serve a similar purpose as their ancient counterparts and are designed for specific landscapes. Contemporary extreme examples of fortified walls include the Korean Demilitarized Zone, or DMZ, the Israeli West Bank Barrier, the U.S.-Mexico border, and the former Berlin Wall. In the case of the U.S.-Mexico border wall, such an extreme physical barrier was deemed nece necessary because of several global political changes. 
This particular wall has been specifically engineered to work within the desert landscape of, South of the Southwest America. Sections of the wall and its buttress system can be lifted by a machine when desert sand dunes begin to bury it, and the sand will simply fall through the cracks of the wall. So here you can see the construction drawings for this wall, so it's been um, specifically engineered for this landscape, which is what I think is so interesting about it. These global zones take on a life of their own in the cultural imagination and collective memory of the world. The infamous Berlin Wall lives on as tourists buy small pieces of the wall as a physical artifact in what has become a kind of war tourism. There have even been calls for a new wall separating Ukraine and Russia based on the US-Mexico model. These massive walls are caught between the medieval tradition of walling off small territories and the massive scale of the global world today. They're being employed at a scale that is almost impossible to con contain, maintain, and oversee. Unsurprisingly, these projects are very controversial. They force society to examine the political, humanitarian, and social values around the subject of a physical architectural object. The material, construction method, and even the exact height of these walls is heavily debated since often the image of the wall will be more important than its physical strength. The last contemporary example that I wanna show is a project that combines the idea of global walls and landscape defenses into the design of a modern zoo. This project for a zoo in Denmark was designed by big architects. This pro proposal is not simply a landform building. The division between people and animals is subtle, but strong. The significance of this scheme is that it does so without the aesthetics of defense. You don't see tall gates or tall walls of the typical variety that you see at a common zoo. Instead, it uses the principles of defense architecture, directed views, earthenworks, and variation in topography to create aesthetics of a landform building that operate defensively. It does so without fences, bollards, or the appearance of totalitarianism. It employs medieval tactics to reach modern results. Before I conclude this lecture, I want to go back to the local. The, qu the local question in Ukraine remains, how can Ukrainians interpret and inhabit the remains of their defense architecture? One thing I've learned in Ukraine is that Ukrainians are very interested in this question. Ukrainians I have met take great pride in the history of their Ukrainian castles. I could hardly go a week in Ukraine without meeting someone new who recommends an entirely new castle for me to visit and study. So I'll talk briefly about a few examples of how these spaces could be reused. The first is Pityrtsi Palace. Today, the palace itself is closed to the public because the building me needs major renovations to be suitable for public access. But the site and the landscape around the palace are well visited. The surrounding landscape and remaining facades of the building are extremely beautiful, and its location near Lviv makes it a unique space for future events. Historians and preservation architects can advise on the restoration of the palace itself. These projects take time, money, and should be undertaken with care. In the meantime, I would like to advocate for a different type of revitalization. I think the real opportunity lies not within the palace itself, but within the site. The bastions, earthworks, and landscape of the site define a zone that can easily be hacked by citizens. I don't think it's as important to find the perfect new program for these spaces. Instead, I think it's more important that there is an overlap of diverse programs that bring new energy into these spaces. It's not difficult to imagine events such as rock climbing, skateboarding, or even swimming happening on the site. 
If we see the landscape simply as the forms that exist today, it's possible to imagine new uses and programs for the site that leave the palace untouched, but that bring a new cultural relevance and energy to the site. Throughout their lifespans, fortresses adapted to the cultural needs of their inhabitants. It was only recently that museums became the dominant program. I could imagine at Alesco Castle, it becoming a destination for outdoor film festivals or educational conferences, in addition to the existing museum and garden that currently activate the site. For inspiration, I think we can look at the example of Tustan. Tustan is an exceptional case for many reasons. First, it was the site of a wooden fortress that was the distinctly Ukrainian style of architecture. Second, the Tustan fortress faces a unique challenge in that there are no physical remains of the fortress for visitors to see, to see today. Because of this lack of physical evidence, the Tustan Preserve has gone to great lengths to help people imagine the fortresses as it was using videos, films, models, drawings, and even light projection laser shows onto the rocks. I think because they have been faced with this challenge, the result has really focused on people and their personal experience of the history. The Tustan Festival, which occurs every year on the site, is a weekend full of a variety of events from sword fighting games for children to educational lectures and craft demonstrations. I think all sites could learn something from Tustan about the variety of activities that can keep history alive. In conclusion, I think this is the moment to rethink the architectural future of public spaces in Ukraine. In the coming years, Ukraine will need to make many physical alterations to its cities and infrastructure. Along with these improvements, there's a new opportunity to examine buildings of historical value as well. As Ukrainians define their identity going forward, connecting to their past becomes even more important. I encourage young architects in Ukraine to think about the future of public spaces and historic sites. No doubt you can imagine solutions that I have not yet dreamed of. Often we have more in common with the past than we wish to admit. There's much contemporary architects can learn from the territorial aims of medieval architecture. The reflection of medieval authority on today's world allows for a new reading of previously unrelated architectural precedents. The questions of defense and territory are at their core spatial problems. Territory, its physical presence, and its symbolic image have always been within the purview of the scope of the architect. It's time for architects to reclaim the stake in their own discipline. Thank you. Um, thank you for, to Ashley for this interesting presentation. To invite you to to have a seat and uh, open the floor for this question and discussion. Now we have a chance to ask questions or share your ideas on the topic. I would like to remind you that we have the simultaneous interpreting going on to have the discussion more useful. If you feel like asking a question in Ukrainian, don't worry, we have the interpretation into English and vice versa. I would like to thank Ashley another time for this presentation. Some very important things that you mentioned that might seem obvious but still uh, should be highlighted additionally. Architecture is usually treated uh, separately, distinctly, architecture as such. Therefore, I think it is very important to talk about the overlapping of different contexts, the cultural context and the political context, the common things that globalization offers to us. When we talk about the modern use of these historical sites and the public space, 
this is a uh, very topical to discuss today in the post-Soviet space, and I have two questions in this respect to you. The first question is about this example of Kamenets Pudilski that you studied. I would really be interested to know your opinion. How, uh, in your opinion, which advantages can you pinpoint in this uh, reuse as the public space? And what are the remaining challenges? And I think that your solutions for the Pidhirtsi Palace is very bold. And I doubt that the directors of our museums would take these bold steps. But in any case, these are very interesting solutions and suggestions that you presented. This is my first question about Kamenitz Podilski. What is your vision of the advantages and disadvantages of revitalization of this uh, historical site? Maybe some improvements that you could offer. My second question is about the reconstruction of the former fortresses. When we talk about the post-Soviet uh, space, there is the bright example of Latvia. When they joined the EU, the EU countries received uh, additional funding, large-scale funding for cultural projects, and we really envy them in that. But uh, what is notable, they sent this money to the old medieval sites uh, that have been destroyed, uh, and they have reconstructed them from scratch, basically. So wh what do you think about such projects when you have to reconstruct from scratch? And another question, more about politics, but I would ask this question later in the end because I don't want to go astray. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, so I think of uh, the first um, about I think advantages and challenges of uh, the revitalization of these fortresses is a, is a great um, place to start. So I think just some you know general advantages of using these fortresses more as public spaces and less as just specifically only historical objects uh, or museum objects. Um, I think for the example of Komenes Podolsky, I think it's a great example because it, it's a really a city fortress. And so the location of the castle is so closely tied to the city um, in its history, in its location, in its you know sort of cultural imagination that that site becomes sort of more than just a, another sort of public square in the city, for example. Um, so I think, you know, the location of that and, and that these sites are um, also they were built for large gatherings of many people. Uh, so I think that, you know, finding some programs that can really capitalize on that intentional, that original use that housing large amounts of people, you know, that these were things that the, the fortresses were really good at. Um, another thing of uh, advantages is their um, relationship to the landscape, which Kamen uh, Svilsky is, is the perfect example of this, uh, because the, the fortress really only exists because of such a unique landscape. And I think just knowing how um, attached people are to their own landscapes, the Ukrainian landscape, um, you know, how unique and how special it is, I think that's also a huge advantage. That this is a really, this is something that architects, modern architects dream about, having a building that's so incorporated with the landscape that it's hard to tell where the building begins and the landscape begins. Um, you know, that's what all modern architects would love to be able to design, something like that. And uh, here, this fortress is already doing that naturally. Um, and so I think learning, learning from a place like this <coughs> fortress um, can even be a tool for modern architects today, to learn how you incorporate natural elements into the building designs. Um, of course, the, the challenges are, are always great, um, especially when, it, when you are 
um, dealing with different groups, different cities, governments, you know, different actors, local citizens, um, and then of course the financial um, is a huge aspect. But of course, in Kamenetsky, they've uh, really just sort of finished a major restoration of this castle, so they've somehow overcame many of those challenges uh, and were able to, to do things um, like that. And the, the um, second point about the reconstruction from scratch, um, it's quite interesting because uh, many people ask me why Ukraine. <laughs> When I wanted to study castles, they said, oh, have you visited the castles in France, the castles in Germany? But to me, those are so much less uh, interesting, actually, because uh, in Ukraine, when you're looking at these castles, you really see these layers of history. Um, you see the different influences, you see the different pieces that were built at different time periods. And because, actually, they haven't tried to uh, rebuild from scratch, totally just chose one date and rebuilt the entire castle to this one date. Um, those castles are less interesting to me. And I think the really interesting thing about Ukrainian castles is that you see this multicultural past as it is in the physical form of the castle. And so I advocate for this kind of layered representation of the castle, actually, instead of the kind of um, blanket representation of, of one specific year uh, in the Middle Ages, because I, as I was trying to point out, these castles had long lives uh, past the Middle Ages, and we hope they will continue to have long lives in the future, and so keeping them uh, changing and evolving with people actually using them and keeping them as active as they were during the Middle Ages, I think is very important. Any other questions or remarks? I would like to give the microphone to somebody else. No, no, please, please speak to the microphone because uh, we need to interpret uh, uh, here. No, no, just talk. Uh, I appreciate you showing us um, this piece of architecture uh, as a Department of State embassies. And, uh, Maybe I can I can just speak louder. It doesn't matter. No, it's it's it's, it's actually a matter. Ah. Yes. So uh, I understand that uh, welcoming end of democracy should be protected, and the uh, embassies uh, have a similar design everywhere. Uh, but these two designs you showed us. Uh, do we have any other analogies in the world? On is it, is it only like Britain, Great Britain, and uh, China? Or they can newer embassies built somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Yes, yes. Um, there, there are also examples. Yes, in, in China, in Berlin, I showed in, in uh, London. And yes, there are other. If you are interested in it, um, it's actually called the U.S. Design Excellence Program. They're doing a brand new uh, embassy also in Mexico City, um, which is still they, they haven't released many images of it, which is why I didn't show an image of it. Um, because, of course, also the design is quite secret of many of these embassies because of real security issues. Um, but the program has done, you know, since 1994 when it started, it's done many different uh, embassy designs all over the world in different countries. Um, so these were just some that I uh, thought were really exceptional uh, examples. But there are, there are others as well. And not just embassies, but I decided to focus on embassies because it's a very clear, very understandable, uh, you know, relationship to, to castles. I thought. Uh, but uh, they know if they go into reconstruction, their existing embassy stories is probably only intended for countries which is inherently friendly to the United States. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it uh, would not work maybe in ev for every single country uh, uh, because th every country has its own security issues, and that's uh, something that's not really in my scope of, of research. You know the much more technical details about it, but uh, but I've, as far as I believe, it's it's when it's possible to make such a such an embassy that they are trying to do this.
recently had the examples of public uh, buildings. And it looks like in Ukraine, we are still trying to go away from what is usually considered to be public. We are trying to build something individual, private. Maybe you managed to see over the time you spent in Ukraine some uh, demonstrations of uh, one's own power in building the private estates. I would like to compliment to this uh, question. I had the same impression and the same question because Ashley and I, we were traveling all around Lviv region and I had the same question. When you go beyond Lviv, you can see some small fortresses. I do not have any definitive answers to that. Maybe after she spent 10 months here, after she managed to learn about our life, maybe she has some ideas, some reasons. Why are we building these private fortresses? It's a um, very interesting question, but maybe also impossible for me to answer, but I will try. Um, you know, I think it's a, it's just natural to have this, this kind of uh, reaction to maybe some extreme um, other socio-political situations that are going on with, you know, maybe uh, the rise of different classes, systems, and things like this. Um, it is interesting to see this. I, I know when we've been driving outside of Lviv, I think you're talking about these houses that maybe have large gates around them, fences around them, and how that kind of territory is really marked um, in a very private and kind of residential scale. Uh, and I think that the scale there is, is very interesting. So at one scale, you have your you know, yard or your garden that you want to wall off, maybe your large house. Um, and then on the other scale, we, we're walling off our country or their, you know, different countries. Uh, and we've lost that in between of the city, of walling off the cities. Um, but I think... <laughs> Um, everything um, is that less is better when it comes to walls, uh, especially in this political situation. But I, as far as public space in Ukraine, um, I've been so pleasantly surprised at the use of public space in Ukraine. I mean, not just Maidan, of course, uh, Maidan really transformed the, the, this idea of using public space in a real way that was very interesting. Um, but even on a, on a daily level, just walking through Lviv every day and noticing uh, the way people are using the space in different seasons of the year, the way that all age groups, people from all types of you know, walks of life are all using the same public spaces. It's been, as an architect, very exciting, very encouraging to see this, um, to kind of watch this transformation from Maidan to barricades to back to public space, you know, in the summer and um, children and old people, just everyone uh, using the space. And that's uh, been one of my favorite um, things about living in Ukraine, and not just public spaces that are squares, uh, and, and you know, not just the Prosherinak, but also the bazaars or the just streets uh, with cafes. You know that that it, it extends beyond just these squares. That it's actually a lot of different parks and spaces in the city, uh, which has been a very great to see. So I, I hope that this kind of you know urban movement to use the public spaces in in different ways. Uh, will carry out into the suburbs, <laughs> but I, I don't know. <laughs> Since you Since you started this topic yourself, then I would go for my question about the wall. You mentioned these examples of the wall. We all know about this project about this idea there are these discussions 
but I've never heard any architects participating in this discussion or historians taking part in this discussion. Maybe I missed to notice that. My question is, what is your attitude towards this topic about this wall in Ukraine? Maybe you'd give, you would be able to give some illustrations uh, from the USA. Has there been any discussion about that? Who participated in that discussion? And so on. For whatever my opinion is worth, I, I think it's a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, this, the, you know, a wall uh, in Ukraine, but that's just my own personal. Um, oh no, it's okay. No. Ah, okay. Um, sorry. So, uh, just my own personal opinion. I think it's a it's a really bad idea. Um, because I think, for for many different reasons, more that it just increases the tensions, and uh, in the end, uh, I'm not sure what what real benefit it would do. Um, of course, that looking at this uh, U.S. example, it's uh, it's actually qu even in the U.S. it's quite controversial. Um, this type of wall, um, there's still a big debate, and I think ever since it was built, there's a big debate every year. There's a debate about. Uh, more wall, less wall, taller wall, thicker wall, you know, exactly how. Um, even with this large wall, uh, there are many different ways people end up, you know, tunneling or inventing systems to get over. So it's kind of, uh, it's almost interesting to see how inventive people are getting through the wall, um, but it, it really turns into a quite sad situation um, when, when it goes wrong. Um, so, so that's one thing, but um, I think, oh, but, but I think about, about architects looking at the wall, I think it's very interesting because um, as I showed, I showed that the construction document of the, uh, of the U.S. wall, because for me it's just so interesting to think actually someone had to design this wall. They don't just appear. <laughs> you know, there's actually a lot of planning, a lot of engineers and planners and maybe architects also who are involved in this because it's actually a huge in piece of infrastructure. It's like building a new bridge or, you know, a, an entire highway system that would run across a whole country. Um, it's a huge undertaking. Um, and someone is designing this. And so I think if architects just sort of stand by and say, well, it's not, you know, not really architecture, you know, with a capital A, uh, that it's something else. I think we're actually giving away part of our profession uh, and, and some of our expertise, actually, which is about design and public spaces and built environments, and that includes infrastructure. You know, where do highways go? How do they influence the local neighborhoods? Where do these walls go? How are they influencing the towns that maybe straddle the border? Um, so how will people in that town deal with this new piece of, of infrastructure? Uh, so I think actually architects are crucial to this discussion, um, wherever it might be. Any more questions, remarks, or comments? Okay, uh, sort of amateur question. Uh, you already mentioned that the smaller castles, uh, like here in Ukraine, in the world, uh, very fast to get over there. Instead of uh, instead of actual fighting for the castles, mm -hmm. so uh, did the small castles uh, had any influence on? Uh, on country defense, actually, because I, I don't see how it could happen. Uh, invading armies could have just passed the castle and take it over or just ignore it completely. So, uh, yeah, I understand uh, in case of the huge citadels, when um, castle defended um, big amount of population, uh, it could influence, um, it could have stopped, you know, invading armies and it could have protected large, large amount of people and uh, even decided uh, the flow of war. But uh, did small castles um, have any influence on mm -hmm. actual warfare? Mm -hmm. um, yes. 
And I will give, uh, again, one example would be Kamenetsbidelsky. Um, it was actually a, a kind of trade center uh, on a trade route. So the marketplaces there were very important for trade. Um, and so that, for example, might be one reason someone would want this, uh, this space. Sometimes uh, these castles were also connected maybe to important landmarks like uh, bridges, for example. So if someone wanted to use this a bridge, uh, like at Khotin, for example, there, there was a bridge there that crossed the river uh, originally. And so maybe someone wants to use this bridge. So it's, it's another reason. Um, also, they really were centers of power for larger, for larger regions, uh, agricultural regions, uh, smaller villages might have been around these castles. So if, if there was anyone who wanted this control of that specific territory for uh, agricultural or farming reasons or um, any any of that kind of thing that would be that would be a reason to to attack them and of course there were battles there were several famous battles at Khotin for example in the 16, 1671 um, there were a few battles and uh, so there were these these large battles um, but often in the medieval times it it was frequently it was sort of the threat of battle and the, a long siege um, that might have just kind of lent to a passing of the castle to the next uh, person for a few years and then maybe back again a few years later, which was uh, quite common. Yeah, but I mean, what stopped people from just actually passing by castle and taking it mm -hmm. later? Mm -hmm. like, especially if it's a small castle. Like, it it mm -hmm. doesn't protect a lot of people, so I don't know, it can house maybe a few hundred soldiers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, how it can influence anything, if you can just uh, pass it behind, leave it mm -hmm. behind. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure that they were allowed to just pass by, actually. I think maybe if you were a, a different uh, army and you just decided to pass by, I'm not sure that would have worked out very well for you. Um, but uh, yes, in, in, in general, I think it's just, it's just sort of the way, the way it worked with the authorities at that time maybe should be directed to a medieval historian, which <laughs> I'm unfortunately not. <laughs> oh, okay, I understand it's also maybe it's a Okay, what about uh, castles outside of Europe? Uh, I, I don't know if you research this or not, but uh, it's kind of interesting question. Um, well, castles were used uh, everywhere in China, in India. Could you speak to microphone? Um, and, um, did uh, Europe was sort of a uh, standard setter for other countries? Or, mm -hmm. uh, for example, we can think about something like conflict in India between uh, East India Company mm -hmm. and uh, Indian authorities at that time. Mm -hmm. um, they still used fortresses, mm -hmm. as far as I know. Mm -hmm. So, um, did they manage to catch up with European standards? or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's basically, first of all, if European standards were standard setters for uh, mm -hmm. other parts of the world, and uh, if other countries catched up to this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, for, for one example about the East India Company, um, I know they were using um, hedge fortifications, actually simil very similar to, to British hedge fortifications. So there definitely were some things that, that made it to India, for example, that were based on British, but that was because of sort of the British influence in India. Um, but in general, the, because the, the Middle Ages in Europe was different and specific to, to Europe and, of, of course, to present-day Ukraine and this region, um, that because those, all of those structures were happening mostly here and kind of did reach a point um, where the politics and societal structures were different, that the castles were really for this region specifically is what I'm looking at is the European Middle Ages and European castles. Um, China, of course, had its own fortification systems, the Great Wall of China, which I showed, um, and others, but really was, uh, you know, quite different architecturally uh, throughout China's history. Their architecture has been very different from Europe. Um, of course, things, you know, it, it, like I tried to emphasize that even in the Middle Ages, there was, there were tra people traveling all over the world. And so there was some exchange between these different civilizations. 
but in general, the way Chinese uh, and Asian architecture developed is very different than uh, European architecture. Any more questions or comments? I am an architect, a lecturer of the Institute of Architecture of the Dvi Polytechnics University. This topic is very interesting for us. You provided very interesting examples and illustrations from Ukrainian castles about the cultural and historical values incorporated in these castles. However, we still uh, face the danger of a threat of losing their aesthetic and cultural values of these castles. As you mentioned, the castles were usually built uh, in the landscapes that usually were most fit for such defensive functions. With the example of Olesko Castle, we can see that the residential area is getting closer and closer to the castle and the landscape is actually uh, destroying or being ignored. And we have many more examples of such uh, buildings that are losing their aesthetic uh, value and also the visual uh, value of the castle because a castle is usually uh, perceived better when it is uh, visually uh, positively perceived. Uh, while the aesthetic or cultural values are protected by the law, by the due legislation, this visual uh, value is not protected. Can you uh, provide any examples of how we could be uh, defending and protecting this element? We also have this Lviv castle, this uh, uh, remains of the wall that uh, probably could be protected somehow because it is not uh, typical of this uh, visual value, this uh, urban expansion. We've had this idea to reconstruct our Lviv castle. There, there have been some discussions for some time, but uh, my subjective opinion is that it's good we stop these discussions, but we used to, to have them. Thank you. Um, yes, thank, thank you for um, noting the, the influence of the landscape, actually, on these castles. And, uh, and like I said, that, that, you know, sometimes that really is the first thing to, uh, to be destroyed, actually, because the landscape takes constant maintenance. Um, and so at some of these, uh, pal at the palace, at the Pirizzi Palace, I know there was originally a garden, uh, a very Italian style garden and was really an integral part of the palace and very important to the overall concept design and for the viewer to see the building in the landscape. It was so important. And unfortunately, um, some of that knowledge is even lost about exactly how the landscapes looked, the different gardens maybe. And so I think, yes, that the landscape is, is very crucial to preserve alongside the building. And sometimes it's even easier to preserve the building because you, you might have drawings or something and, and sometimes the landscapes, it's unclear what was the original landscape. Um, so I think that's a, a huge, uh, it is part of this visual value of uh, of these castles and so I, I do hope that when there are uh, projects that are looking at what to do with these castles they really try to incorporate the landscape very much. Um, as far as what we can do now about it, um, you know, I, I think sometimes also it's um, about educating the public also about the importance of um, the way to to treat the castle site, for example, the, you know, the history of the castle and also the history of the landscape that goes along with the castle. So I think you know, one of the first things is just to, that people understand um, that that's an important part of the history. 
uh, and that they can you know, keep that alive through maintaining the grounds, for example. Um, I would, you know, even love to see um, community groups or organizations who maybe are looking for uh, an urban space to take care of or a new kind of public park project. You know, I know even in Lviv there are many, like, student organizations and different groups who are always looking for the next project to improve public space. And um, I would encourage those groups to think about, you know, these castles and, and what kind of, what can you do with a group of people on a weekend, you know, to go to the castle and volunteer some time and, um, you know, do something. Uh, and so that's also a possibility. Um, I'm an architect and I used to work for a long time in the reconstruction of castles in Transcarpathia region and I would like to tell that it would be really interesting to study the small castles in uh, Transcarpathia, Chenaydi, Evo, Korolavo, Sharnborn Castle. Now it's the sanatorium resort area. There is a problem because you can trace the stages, uh, the same stages that uh, the big castles were undergoing. For instance, the Chinadivo castle is the residential building facility that is protected by towers from the four sides. So this is the combination of the defensive and the residential function. Very interesting and peculiar example. There are so many more interesting things in the Transcarpathia small castles that you could find in your studies. But there is another problem. When the businesses or commercial companies uh, go into the use of these castles, are they trying to cherish the value of these sites? It is very important uh, not to allow them destroying these castles. For example, in Mukachevo castle, you can see how they are distorting the roofs with the modern uh, antenna, TV antennas. Nobody's trying to take care of that. And also, they are trying to exploit this site as much as possible. But they hardly do anything to maintain the castle, at least in the condition it used to be because that they are trying to adapt some of the facilities to the shops, whatever, commercial areas, exploiting the site. But the very Mukachevo castle is being ruined, and it requires significant funding for renovation and for maintenance. Mm -hmm. Sophia maybe want to add something sure. to this uh, question here? First of all, I would like to thank Ashley for her tour around the time and space that makes us think about the new links between the things we would hardly bring together under other conditions. And also, I had a question about the commercial aspects. My question is about the resources. On the one hand, uh, it is a question about the models, the available models. We, in the situation of post-Soviet countries, post-socialist countries, these are mostly public buildings. These historical sites, they are, they used to be uh, exploited as public buildings. Who should be taking charge of that? And in which way? And your question about security and the feeling of security could also lead us to the question of trust in the sense that we do not trust the state, the authorities, that they could take care of these sites in a proper manner. We do not trust the businesses because they would destroy it, the sites on their part as well. This is a closed cycle. How do we uh, actually break this vicious circle? In your experience, can you give us more illustrations or examples of the second life of these uh, medieval sites when they combine public, private, commercial, and other functions? And 
different ways of using these sites in a new way and to give them their second life. And I really loved when you were telling us about the Tustan fortress. And I somehow it came to my mind like the best project is the virtual project. It has the site, the landscape, the area, but it has no walls, in fact. So how do we build the engaged relations with the sites and the facilities? We can see with the example of this Tustan fortress, uh, the good example of this non-existent historical site that could revive the historical spirit. But how do we do this in the sites that are still there? Thank you for this interesting presentation, gave me a lot of new ideas. Um, th thank you for both of those uh, questions. And I think um, you've really hit on the most difficult question <laughs> uh, for me and I think for, for everyone. But um, so, so I will say definitely you've uh, identified that the, the commercial is really a problem, can, can be a big problem with this, uh, with different commercial uh, companies. I, I know also at Tustan they had to, uh, uh, there was a company trying to build a hotel even just next to the, the site. Um, which they had to to take to court, and uh, have the building has now stopped. But even there, they they have also the same problems with commercialization. Um, I was just at Mukachevo last weekend, so I saw you know all the different shops and and everything that's been opening at Mukachevo. Um, so I think, you know, where do you get these resources is, is a huge question because I think there there is a possibility for some private companies who really have the same goals as uh, citizens and other, you know, local historians. And, you know, I, I don't think it's impossible that uh, private companies could help. And I also don't think it's impossible that the government could be, uh, you know, a force for good. I think the, maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle or a combination of, uh, of those two forces, someone who has the maybe financial resources and someone who can kind of oversee and maintain to make sure that the uh, historical integrity is not compromised. Um, so I think it's probably some sort of combination of, of private, public, also locals, and I think the, that the local input is very important. So for Mukachevo Castle, you know, it should be the people who live in the city should have uh, a say and a voice, but also people who uh, who live in Lviv would have a voice because it's really you know a castle that's in this uh, district of Ukraine, and uh, and also voices from Kiev. So I think it's really a combination of different levels of people um, and different organizations, historians, architects, uh, anthropologists, uh, basically anyone who wants to to comment on this. I think their voices should be heard. Um, for some uh, examples, I think. Uh, the reason I did show Tustan is because they do such a great job, and it's it's almost like they are more free to do whatever they want because they don't have this physical object that becomes the controversial point. Because they just have this beautiful landscape, um, and they've been so interested in the different ways that of recreating the space. But I think at any of these spaces, you could have such um, digital exhibitions, you know, combination of uh, video, music, um, whatever kind of uh, online presence that these spaces could have to kind of make it a more um, layered experience of the building because these buildings have such a layered history. So to understand the way that might be presented um, in the exhibition downstairs about digital history. You know, I think there's some really great interactive things in that that show, try to uh, present that layered history in a unique way. And um, some sort of exhibition like that at these castles could be a really interesting thing to, to see the layers of history on top of each other. Um, I think for one country that has, they, they have very different problem, um, but I think Germany has actually been able to do some very interesting things with their uh, remnants of World War II, for example. It's a it's much different time period, so it has 
you know, it's it's different set of challenges and, and advantages. But several projects in Germany that uh, have reused World War II bunkers, for example, in unique ways um, as um, discos, as dance studios, as offices, as, you know, ba basically any program you can think of, there have been some interesting way to incorporate those into these structures. Um, so looking at what is the advantage of a bunker, it's soundproof, essentially. So how, you know, what types of programs need to be soundproof? Recording studios, nightclubs, you know? So, you know, what are the advantages of these castles, you know? Um, the thickness of the walls, maybe their location geographically, you know, kind of trying to identify what's the advantage of this site and how can we use that? Um, and there, in those projects in Germany, they chose architects who were extremely sensitive to the, also the historic value and uh, interpretation of the German history. And so how will that German history of World War II live on and be presented to the next generation? Uh, and some of those projects have been very successful, I would say, at, at doing that. Um, and so I think that's, a, that's another interesting example of, of places to look. We don't always have to look at just castles that have been, you know, renovated. It could be World War II bunkers or um, other historic buildings. Any other questions? I believe this lecture and this discussion brought forward very important issues. We usually perceive and treat these fortresses as historical sites, the landmarks. But I think it is important to be bold, experimenting, trying out different options. I believe these are the experts, the local community, the authorities, all of us who can say their uh, word into giving new life to these sites. And I think this lecture was exactly about this. Thank you to Ashley. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for coming to listen.